much Christian radio you, you listen to during the week, but there's this great song uh, by this band called The Afters, and the song is called Battles. And I love the first line of it, um, because the first line is a song about how God can fight for you. He can help you with all your stressful times. And the, the song opens with this line. It's a great line. It says, this current is trying to wreck me. Have you ever felt like that in life? Where it's like, it's not just one thing coming at you that feels like, oh, that's a little problem, that's a little stress. It's like everything. It's like, it's not just you have a big test next week, or just your car breaks down, or just you get in an argument with a loved one, or just a loved one gets sick, or just you get a sudden cut in hours at your job, or a bill comes in the mail, and that's all that happens that you weren't expecting, or someone you thought you could trust flakes on you. It's like all of that got together and said, let's attack them at the same time. Right? You ever been there? You have like these weeks where it's like everything, it feels like a current of problems is trying to wreck you. Right? And if you have been there, then I have good news, because Joshua knows how you feel. <laughs> because as we open up the book of Joshua today, at the very beginning, you have to understand what he was facing, okay? If you've been following with us this whole time in, in, the, in the Old Testament, then you know the story. This is about 40 or so years after God did this dramatic rescue, got his people out of slavery, and with this amazing leader named Moses, and he's been leading them, and just this amazing godly leader. And now they're at the edge of this river called the River Jordan, and all they got to do is cross it, and they're in this land God promised. This will be your home. What we know today is Israel, okay? They're about to take over Israel. It's not Israel yet. But God's like, you're going to get your home. It's going to be awesome. All you got to do is cross this river and take out some bad guys. And that's exciting stuff, except for three big things. First of all, Moses just died. Right? If you've been reading with us, Moses, this leader, this godly guy that's been carrying all this weight, died. So first of all, Joshua is probably grieving the death of Moses, which if you've ever grieved a loved one, you know it's not easy to just snap out of that and get back to work. You know, Back then they took even longer, but Moses wasn't just a leader, he was Joshua's friend, and he died. So he's dealing with grief. Then he now is in the job of leading all these people, about two million total, who if you've been reading know are not the easiest people to oversee, right? They whine, they complain, they're draining, they're very stubborn, and it's Joshua's job to lead them now while he's having grief. And what he has to lead them to do is go into this, this area where there's all these groups, as the Bible says, they have to take on the Parasites, the Hittites, the Canaanites, the Amorites, all these other ites, and, uh, which, as author, I read this great book by Max Lucado about Joshua. And he says, you know, those may just be odd names to us, but those were names that struck fear into the hearts of the Hebrew people back then. Because those tribes were a cesspool of evil. Okay, they appear on the pages of Scripture as early as the promise of God to Abram in Genesis 15. And for eight centuries, the Amorites alone had cultivated a culture of degradation. It says they sacrificed babies in worship to their gods. So look at baby Ivy. Imagine burning her alive to a block of wood. They did that over and over and over. They also, um, as a history tells us, they would uh, dedicate themselves to witchcraft and idolatry. They practiced orgies in the city. One scholar called Canaan back then a snake pit of child sacrifice and sacred prostitution. There were people who were ruthlessly devoted to using the most innocent and vulnerable people in the community to try and manipulate gods for gain. So they would throw babies in the fire, they'd snatch virgins and use them as prostitutes to try to get the favor of their idols. And atheists go, gee, I don't understand why God would want to destroy these guys. He's so mean. No. How could a good God look at that and not do something, right? So God tells Joshua, you're going to go in and take all these people out because I can't stand this evil anymore. Um, as of the book of Jubilees, which was probably written in the second century BC, it called the Amorites an, quote, an evil and sinful people whose wickedness surpassed that of any other. Imagine the most evil person you can think of and think that's nothing compared to these guys, okay? So you add this all up, and you've got Joshua, who's grieving a best friend, who's suddenly in charge of two million very dreaming people, and has to go take on these guys, these psychos, right? And if anyone knows what it's like to feel a current of stress coming their way, I think it's safe to say it's Joshua as we open up chapter 1 here. And I'm so glad he wrote all this down. Because the things that God says to Joshua, right in the middle of that, just might be the same things you need to hear this morning. Or when you go through your next wave of stress. Um, so let's check it out. Starting in verse 1. Let's see what we can learn from it. We'll do the whole chapter today. Joshua chapter 1. It says this. You got, you, 
you know, like in football, there'll be like a locker room talk in the halftime, and I don't know what they said in the Super Bowl to the Patriots, but it must have been good. And it's like, come on, we're going to go, we're going to go, we're not losing. But, you know, this is like a locker room talk. God's like, Joshua, come here, let's have a locker room talk. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them, to the Israelites. I'll give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. So be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Don't turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. That's a good locker room talk. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get your stuff ready, right? Three days from now, you will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own. If you've been reading with us, then this next part will make sense. If not, don't worry about it. It's not, <laughs> we're going to talk about other stuff. But to the Reubenites, the Gadites, the half-tribe of Panassah, Joshua reminds them, hey, remember that command Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you after he said, the Lord your God will give you rest by giving you this land. Your wives and your kids and your livestock can stay in the land Moses gave you east of the Jordan, but all your fighting men, ready for battle, and you're going with us. You need to cross over ahead of your fellow Israelites. You are to help them until the Lord gives them rest, as he's done for you, until they too have taken possession of the land the Lord your God is giving them. After that, you may go back and occupy your own land, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you east of the Jordan toward the sunrise. And they asked, answered Joshua, whatever you commanded us, we'll do. Wherever you send us, we'll go. Yes, sir. Right? Just as we fully obeyed Moses, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your word and does not obey it, whatever you may command them will be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. Isn't that a great chapter? Oh my gosh, I love that chapter. So let's take it apart piece by piece. So first, I love how God jumps right in with reassuring Joshua there. All right? Look at verse 2 again. As Max Lucado says, Before Joshua can even assemble any fears, God gave him reason for faith. Verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people, go, right? And as Max Lucado, I'm going to quote him a lot. He has a great chapter on this. He goes, you know, we would take a different track, wouldn't we? We would take the track of Moses is dead. Now then, grieve, <laughs> retreat, reorganize, find a therapist, right? But God said, now then, go, basically, right? Get ready and go, which already gives us a hint of a major theme you'll see in Joshua, that no matter how dire the circumstances look, when you have God, that changes everything, right? The leader with a little L may have died, but the leader with a big L, you know, he's still around. And uh, notice what he says there. He, does, he doesn't say cross the Jordan into the land I might give you, right? He doesn't say the land you have to conquer, you know, the <coughs> land you have to prove you're worthy of, the land you have to earn or confiscate or purchase. He says, no, you cross over to the land I am about to give you, right? As in settled, this is settled, Joshua. There's no doubt here, okay? This land will be yours. Verse 3, look at that again. I will, circle, underline, highlight, I will give you every place where you set your foot. As I promised Moses, your territory will, circle, underline, highlight, extend from the desert to Lebanon, from the great river Euphrates to the Mediterranean Sea. Verse 5, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will, circle, underline, highlight, be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. In other words, Joshua, you need to understand something, Okay. I'm God, I already know the end of the story, and you win. You can't lose, okay, as long as you stay with me. Because I promise to give you this land, and I'm a God who keeps my promises, and I'm with you. Which is the first good thing to note if, we're, if you're taking notes this morning. What are some things we can learn from Joshua 1 about how to deal with difficulties and waves of stress and feeling overwhelmed? Number one, you hold on to the promises God made you about your circumstances. Because he's made a lot of them in that book we call the Bible. And uh, the cool thing is he keeps every single one. You know, we, we have a lot of flaky people 
in this area. Growing up in Sacramento, I got very used to people saying, I'll be there at 5 o'clock, and they show up at 4.55, you know? Um, and then Amy and I moved here, and people were like, I'll be there at 5 o'clock, and you may or may not see them at all. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just flakiness. But God goes, you need to understand, I'm not like that. I'm not like Monterey people, okay? I'm God. I keep my promises no matter what. You can trust them without fail. Which one of his promises is the second one that he says to Joshua here and says to every Christian later in the New Testament. He says, I will never leave you. You put your faith in Jesus. You connect with me. I will never leave you. Whatever you're going through, you are not going through it alone. You are never alone if you have God in your life. I'll never forsake you. What's that mean? I'll never turn my back on you with no hope of return. You know, sometimes we get concerned, oh, I yelled at my spouse or I did something bad. Maybe God's mad at me. He goes, I will never turn my back on you, ever. I'm with you in this thing. It's my promise. Now, as you'll see, if you read through the book of Joshua with us this week, the whole thing, Joshua doesn't get to claim these two and just sit back on a lounge chair, okay? He still has to cross the Jordan. He still has to go fight and show up and do what God says to do. His enemies don't just go poof and disappear. But the Bible also says later on, man, when God is for you, who can be against you? Come on. God says, I won't leave you. This current that's trying to wreck you, ain't going to wreck you. You stick with me. So, as God says next there, verse 6, be strong and courageous. Did you notice he said that a few times, too, in this chapter? He says it like three times within four verses. Uh, be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to give to their ancestors. To give. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all my law. Keep this book of the law. Verse 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do you get the sense? Maybe God wants him to be strong and courageous. <laughs> That's a good one to write down for number three. How do you make it through tough times? Listen to God when he says, don't wimp out. <laughs> be strong. Be courageous. Uh, in the Hebrew language, it was originally written in the, the first word that we translate as be strong there. It's this word, hazak. I love it. Hazak! <laughs> Say that to, your, to yourself in the mirror someday. It's called hazak! You know? And what it means, it covers physical and moral strength. It's not just about do P90X or something. Okay? It's about be strong morally, too. Um, it means to prevail, to show or have courage, to seize, to grasp, to keep hold of. My favorite definition of it, though, is it can also mean to be stubborn in Hebrew. Love that. God's basically saying, you be stubborn for me. <laughs> I love that. That's my favorite one. Be strong for me. Don't you back down. Be stubborn in a good way. And then the word we translate courageous there, this word a mess, which actually doesn't mean you're a mess, uh, but uh, it means to be, again, strong, to strengthen, to prove to be strong. So there's a lot of be strong in that one little sentence. God's like, don't live out. Be strong. Which honestly is something I think a lot of Christians in our culture need to get back to these days. Myself included. Because when I look around our culture, I don't really see Christians looking very strong or courageous these days. I love how comedian Tim Allen uh, said it. To paraphrase him, he goes, you know, we look like we're more worried about who we might offend than who we might inspire. And that's a problem. You know, and as a result, far too often we live so passively in our culture you know, we never share any God-focused opinions with people. We never appropriately confront people when it's time to do so. And God would say, hey, you should, you know, to help them get on track. We never really push back against certain things that push against our faith and push against what God's called us to do. We basically just don't have much of a voice if you look around our culture these days. And instead, we play it way too safe. We talked about that a few months ago with our, our Jesus Called series. And we just kind of have this, eh, do whatever you want attitude. I'm sorry, I don't want to make anybody mad. <laughs> and we actually make zero room for this adventure and spontaneity God wants us to have. You know, like Joshua. Imagine if Joshua's like, well, all these guys, I mean, that's just their thing. They burn babies. You know what? Who am I to say that's wrong? God says, no, I'm God. I say it's wrong. Go get them. You know? <laughs> Be strong and courageous. Don't wimp out when it comes to appropriately standing up for God and doing stuff he says to do. As Joshua here is very much a reminder, I think God would look at a lot of wimpy, passive Christians in our country and our culture and go, be strong and courageous, what are you doing? You know, there's people dying in other countries just to own a Bible right now. And you're afraid of what your neighbor's going to think if you try to tell them about Jesus? You know, speak up for Jesus with gentleness and respect. The Bible does say that. In love, but you still speak up. You do it boldly, you know, unashamed. I remember back in college, I was in this English class, and the professor was, we had to read this article 
about why living together was a great idea and all this stuff. And so we were talking about that in class, and I'm new to the class, and this is right when I'm going through some anxiety issues and working through that. And the teacher goes, you know, so what did you think of the article? And everybody's talking, oh, I think it's great. Men and guys and girls should live together, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, let's hear from the Christians out there. Any Christians? And I did not want to raise my hand. I'll tell you. I'm sitting in class, I'm like, no, I'm comfortable right here. I won't talk. And I had this moment where God was like, don't you dare not raise your hand. So I'm like, okay. <laughs> and so he's like, Matt, why do you think that's not okay? Well, uh, you know, and I got it out there, and it started a good conversation. And the funny thing was, that professor came to love me in his class and this other girl that was a Christian. Because something I don't think we realize is people who are genuine and strong people aren't afraid to be challenged because they know it actually makes them better. You know, if they're immature, they might go, oh, you're stupid Christian, I can't take it. And I had some professors like that too. But, you know, someone who actually gets it and, and actually is a strong person, they're like, challenge me. If I'm wrong, I want to know. You know, let's have a conversation. And I still may not agree with you, but at least we'll have an authentic relationship because I'll know who you really are. You're not hiding who you are. You let out, no, I believe in Jesus and that's wrong. <laughs> okay, well, I disagree, but at least I have a respect for you. At least we can have a real authentic relationship here. Don't forget that sometimes it's actually the strong, authentic people that want to be challenged. And don't let it stop you from speaking up for Jesus when it's time to do so. And yeah, but they might suffer. God goes, good. <laughs> Embrace suffering for Jesus. It's an honor. You read the book of Acts. They got beaten for talking about Jesus. Stop talking about Jesus. No, they beat him. And the church doesn't hide. Go, oh, maybe we should stop. They go, let's have a party. That was awesome. We suffered for the Jesus who suffered for us. What a stinking honor. Man, where did we lose that Christian mindset? That was the early church. How did we get from there to where we are here so many times? I love how Paul says it in Galatians. He goes, you know, if I were still trying to please people, I wouldn't be a Christian. Because the world is going that way, Jesus says go that way, and you're going to bump into some people, and they're not going to like it, and who cares? we got to get to the place where we're okay with people not liking us in favor of God liking us, right? Be strong and courageous. You're not going to win the respect of all these tribes, Joshua. They're going to try to kill you back. You stand firm for me. You do what's right, even when everyone else around you says, oh, let's do something else. Playing it safe isn't really safe anyway when you think about it. Because you're going to have hard times, you're going to get rejected, because those are coming anyway. So when the hard times and the suffering and rejection and hurt come, they might as well mean something, right? It might as well be because you stood up for Jesus, and that's why. Now, if you're a jerk, that's not fair. Don't be a jerk. But you just stand firm for Jesus. No, this is what I believe. No, I'm not going to compromise there, because he says, and I'm living for him. And people condemn you for it, fine. You know, at least the suffering matters. As someone once said, you know, the world doesn't need a bunch of Mr. Nice Guys. The world needs a bunch of Mr. Honest Guys. Miss, Miss, Miss Honest Gal. Who are you? Who, what does Jesus mean to you? Don't let people make you wimp out on that. Share the truth. Be strong and courageous. Speak the truth in love. Speak it with grace. You want to know what that looks like? Look at Jesus. He's the ultimate example of grace and truth together. Get into the Gospels. Don't, now hear me, don't look at the Jesus you have in your head or the Jesus our culture talks about, because those aren't always the same as what's in the Bible. Read the Bible. What was Jesus like? Be strong and courageous. Because of one and two, because of what God's promised you, because he's with you, you can be strong and courageous. And founded on the next one we'll talk about here. You know, our culture is so good about, let's throw this seminar and write this book about how to be prosperous and successful. And uh, the thing is, the Bible tells you how to be prosperous and successful way before any of that was ever written, right? And I love this because according to God, it's not just about money in the Bible. Occasionally it includes money, but as Max Lucado says, you know, far more often being prosperous and successful refers to having a wealthy spirit and mind and body. It means God prospering the leader with new skills, the worker with good sleep, the teacher with added patience, the mother with deeper affection, the elderly with greater hope. Where do you find that kind of prosperity? Look at this, verse 7. God, in between all his be strong and courageous, God says, Joshua, you be careful to obey everything, or to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. I love what Max Lucado says. He says, you know, like you and me, Joshua had a Bible. His Bible just had five books, you know, Genesis through 
Deuteronomy, um, which were carried along the side of the Ark of the Covenant, but it wasn't enough for Joshua to just have the scriptures near him. God wanted the scriptures to have Joshua. God didn't command Joshua to seek a spiritual experience, pursue a personal revelation, or long for goosebump giving emotion. God's word to him is his word to us. Open your Bible. <laughs> Meditate on it day and night. Literally in Hebrew, that means you shall mutter over this Torah document. It's this image of a person reciting, rehearsing, reconsidering God's word over and over and over again. Why? Because as Max Lucado says, you know, Canaan is going to be loud with enemy voices, just like our culture is. The devil megaphones doubt and death into our ears. So take heed to the voice you heed. And number four, get into your Bible. Get into your Bible. One of the be best methods I've ever come across for that, where to put it, <laughs> is uh, the soap method that's in these life journals. So if you don't know about that, grab one, read the first few pages, it'll explain it. That's the best thing I have found in all my years as a Christian, let alone as a pastor, about how to get into the Bible. Also, if you haven't already done so, sign up for our daily Bible text. Read through the Bible with us. It'll help you. We're starting Joshua today. If you got behind or you just gave up, start again. Joshua is an awesome book, especially if you like action movies. It's going to get really good really fast. Um, another thing that I found helpful is this little book. It's, I've, I've used this since college. It's uh, Where to Find It in the Bible, A to Z. If you want to know about adolescence, beauty contests, computers, credit, diets, uh, environment, finance, genetics, hell, shopping, independence, jewelry, marriage, mortgages, networking, psychology, parenting, stress, taxes, voting, zoology. It's all in the Bible if you know where to find it. And this little book helps you. And it's fun, too. It has little cartoons in it, um, too. Like, there's this one that has Honest Saul's Used Idols. I just think that's, that one's hilarious. But um, if, you're, if you're like somewhere, man, I'm having problems with my marriage. What does the Bible say about marriage? Guess what? You can look at marriage. And it will list, next to a cute cartoon, a bunch of verses to look up about marriage. I'm really discouraged. God, look up encouragement. Bunch of verses about encouragement. God, what does the Bible say about the internet? Guess what? It has principles. Look up internet. Principles right there. And if you're saying to yourself, man, that's pretty cool. I'd like one of those. Then good news. We got you one. On your way out today, Kira will be at the back. And every family gets one of these. We might even have enough. For, now let's just do one per family. Um, and I take this and get into your Bible. Get into the Bible. How do you make it through tough times? God tells you, hey, hold on to my promises. We've well, got to know what they are. You know, hey, I'll never leave you. Be strong and courageous and get into the Bible. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Then the last one there. And this is a big one. Because you can have all those, and those are all good. But I think you need number five, too, which is this. For it. Stay connected with God's people. you got to stay in community with other people that follow God. Where on earth do I see that? At the end of the chapter. Because uh, after God spoken to Joshua, repeatedly said, Be strong, courageous, be strong, courageous. Then what happens? Then Joshua turns to the people, says, Hey, keep your promises, let's go fight. And I love what they do. Verse 16, real quick, look at that. After Joshua talks to them, then they answered Joshua, Whatever you've commanded us, we'll do. Wherever you send us, we'll go. Just as we obeyed Moses, we'll obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Look at this. Whoever rebels against your word and does not obey it, whatever you may command them, they'll be put to death. Be strong and courageous. What's that saying? They're saying, A, we got your back. This community that may drive you crazy sometimes, kind of like church. You know, people may drive you nuts and drain you, but we got your back because we're family. Why, are we, why do we get you guys stuff like this? Because we want you to succeed because we're family. God says you need that. And then notice what else they do. We got your back. And number two, they remind him of what God just said. They encourage him. They go, hey, be encouraged. Remember what God said like 10 verses ago? Be strong and courageous. That's in this chapter for a reason. Because while we certainly need one through four, we need five too. The Bible's pretty clear about that. We need a community of people around us who have our back, who can build us up, who can encourage us, remind us of things God has said. And, uh, you know, back in Genesis 2, we are talking about how the first thing in all of creation that was not good was what? Loneliness. So God fixed it. And I love in the New Testament, it, Peter says in the New Testament, you know, doing life alone is something non-Christians do. Like, before you knew Christ, that, that's when you do life alone. When you come to know Christ, you become part of the church, this family. So don't miss that. Even in the book of Hebrews, it commands, do you know the Bible actually commands you not to miss church? It says, don't you give up meeting together. You encourage each other. Be that family. And you'll see as you go through Joshua how those play out and how important those are as they take on all these bad guys. Check it out this week. 
And also, live out your own adventure with God. Because the same kinds of things he says to Joshua, the same principles apply to us. When you're going through a tough time, don't let it stop you. You respond with faith in his promises, with remembering that he's with you. By being strong and courageous, don't wimp out. Because of one and two, be strong and courageous. Stick with your Bible and stick with church. And God goes, you'll make it through even the craziest battle you're going to face. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, thank you for Joshua chapter 1. Thank you for your words to him and that contain such important principles that can also easily be words to us in the battles we face. We may not face evil armies this week, some of us might, but uh, more often it's, it's that unexpected bill, it's that illness, it's that friend, it's that job situation, it's that marriage fight that comes at us. God, help us in those times to remember Joshua 1 to cling to your promises, to draw near to you, to be strong and courageous for you, not, not to be jerks, to respond with gentleness and respect and love and grace, but boldness. It is possible, Jesus, you did it all the time. Help us follow your example of strength and courage as we base our lives on your word every day, tackle this thing called life together as a family that has each other's back 24-7. Help us live it out. Joshua chapter 1. According to your will. In Jesus' name.